Can you guys believe that Christmas is literally just right around the corner? I mean, you can believe it because you know it's coming, but it seems like it has just been you know, moving at a breakneck speed here lately, uh, and I've been enjoying being in this series. You guys have been enjoying being in this series? It's been good to look at the effects of Christmas and uh, you know, exactly what Christ did for us and uh, how that maybe changes who we are. I want to start off again today reading the same passage of Scripture we've started off with every week. Because I think it's good for us to really reflect on these words. And that is out of Isaiah 9, 6. And this is what it says. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, how many of you guys, when you think about those words, within your heart, you feel joy? Come on now. You're all going to have to act, you're going to have to make up for the people that are not able to be here this morning. You have to act a little bit more excited uh, as we go. But I mean, doesn't that well up some joy? Isn't it good to know that, that the Lord was good to us? That the Lord came and He dealt with something that we could never deal with? You see, the issue that we all have, and that we all have had, and that everybody, whoever will be alive, will have, is that we have to wrestle with our sinful nature and the consequence of our sin. And no matter what we do, we can't undo the effects that that has caused or brought into our lives. But it's good to know that at some point, that God said that it wasn't good enough to just let it go. That He was going to come and that He was going to personally deal with our problems. And because He has, we give our worship, like we see here in Isaiah, to the Lord because we recognize that God has been good to us. That God does love us. And that God has made a way where before there was what? No way. And so God is good. And and, and for us who are believers, for those who have given ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ and who have chosen to live and serve Him, when we think about what God has done, it can't help but bring joy into our heart. Because how many of you recognize that before Christ came into your life, life wasn't that great? Some of y'all are willing to admit that, aren't y'all? Everybody else is like, I'm not so sure. And I'm not saying that, look, we have all of us have good moments and we have bad moments. But there's a certain level of despair when you're living life without the Lord and you don't have His goodness in your life. You don't have His help. You don't have His mercy. You don't have the things that come when you get to know the Lord. And how many of you recognize the change in your life as God has worked His righteousness in you? And so for us who love the Lord, for those who follow the Lord, there is an extreme joy and appreciation that that becomes even overwhelming to us because we can see how God has made such a difference in us. And we recognize who we were before and we recognize where we were headed and we recognize that God has saved us. And you know, saved, we say the word saved in church, that gets thrown around so much, I think it loses its meaning. But the truth is that each one of us have been saved because of what Christ did. And to say that we've been saved, it means that we were headed for destruction, but somebody came and they grabbed us out of that place, and they took us away from the danger, and they put us someplace safe. Have you ever gotten yourself in a situation where you were in trouble? When I was in youth ministry, we used to take the kids out to, there was a lake, we would live down by Lake Monroe in Bloomington, and we used to take all the kids out during the summer, and we would get one of those double-decker pontoons with the slide and the whole deal, and we'd have a a day at the lake. And there was one kid who decided he was going to jump in the water, with, and he didn't have a, a, a life preserver of any kind. And I remember he started freaking out. He wasn't that far from the boat, but he started freaking out because he discovered really quick that he was not a good swimmer. 
And you have to wonder about a kid who has never really been in the water who decides they're going to go out for a swim. And so he, he, you see the panic that came on his face. And so I quickly jumped in the water, swam over to him. And, and let me tell you something. It's never fun to try to save someone who's drowning. They try to push you under. They're like in panic mode. But I grabbed this kid and I swam him back to the boat. And I'm telling you, like, he went from panic fear to like, whew, everything's okay. And we've all been in a situation like that. But that is what saving is. Each one of us was headed for our own destruction and the Lord came in and He grabbed us when we couldn't do anything and He put us in a place that was safe. He brought us back to safety and put us in a position where we didn't have to fear anymore. Those are the things we've been talking about over the last few weeks. And this is, listen, this is the good news. The good news is that God came and saved us. I want to read a passage of Scripture to you right now because here's what the angels declared on the evening that Jesus was born. It says in Luke 2, 10-11, And the angels said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a what? A Savior who is Christ the Lord. And so here the, the, the good news is proclaimed perhaps really uh, uh, for the first time. Because here the solution had come. Christ was born. There was many a promise of good news that was on the horizon uh, uh, the Jews lived under this promise of good news, but the good news wasn't fully there. On this evening, the good news came, and the good news was this, that a Savior was born. Do you recognize that they didn't just declare good news, Jesus is born? We recognize Jesus as the Savior, but what they declared was the Savior was born, the One who was going to come and save us from sin, had been born. And so this was the good news that they declared. But I want you to understand something. Because this is something that we need to recognize. It says in this particular passage, it is good news of what? Great joy! You see, this is not just good news. We've all experienced good news. Sometimes that good news has come after bad news. And we think, oh man, the bad, this bad situation has come upon us. But then eventually good news comes. And we feel better. Sometimes good news is just good news. Something good happens. And it's good. But here, he's saying, look, there is good news of great joy. This is so good, this good news, that it brings great joy with it. Because today, the Savior has been born. That thing in which God has promised from one generation to another generation to another generation, that thing that has been promised to you, your redemption, it has come. And it's not just good news. It's not just great news. It's joyful news. Because for the person who is lost, the offer to be saved is everything. Do you recognize that? For the person who knows how bad they have it, when they're given something good, they recognize how good what they have received really is. And it's no different with this. When the sinner recognizes that they have no power over their sin, and they recognize that God has a solution, that's not just good news, that's not just great news, that fills me with joy kind of news. Because I recognize that something that I couldn't make happen has now happened. I'm excited about it. 
And so today I want to talk about joy. We've been talking about some of the different Advent themes. These are the traditional themes of Advent. Advent. Hope. Love. Joy. And peace. Today we're going to land on joy because I want to talk about the joy that comes from the Lord. Because how many of you recognize that living for the Lord should be a joy filled experience that living for the lord is not just some humdrum boring put my nose to the grindstone try to be a good person kind of a reality when you know jesus when you know the god of the universe when he says he loves you and when he has provided a way for you to be redeemed you should be living in joy so why are we filled with churches of pucker butts and people that are uptight and wound up? And I think we need to explore the joy of being a Christian. Because the Lord meant this to be a joyful thing. And so where does the Christian find joy? I want to talk about that a little bit this morning. The first thing is, is that, first of all, we need to understand that joy is not found in circumstance. So if you're following along in the notes, joy is not found in our circumstances. Habakkuk, hey, when was the last time you read Habakkuk? You're like, I didn't even know that was in the Bible. Habakkuk says this in Habakkuk 3, 17 through 18. It says, Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Now I want to lay this out for you. It's pretty actually self-descriptive, isn't it? But what he's describing is he's saying, look, even if everything I have is taken away, you see, he, he lived in an agricultural community, not too much unlike here. But people depended not only on what they produced agriculturally to make a living, they depended on it to just live and survive. If they didn't have the, the fruit for, that came from the trees and the vine, and they didn't have the produce that came from the ground, and they didn't have the animals that they were raising, if they didn't have all of those things, it didn't just mean that they would have a bad year financially. It meant that they would probably most likely starve and not make it through the winter. And so what he's describing isn't just a bad scenario. It's the worst scenario. This is literally nothing. None of the fruits of my labor have come to, be, to bring anything. I have lost everything. And he says, listen, even though I lose everything, he says, I will take joy in the God of my salvation. He says he will rejoice in the Lord. There's something going on in Habakkuk's heart and with his faith that we need to tap into. Because here's the thing, we have been raised where we depend on our circumstances to, to tell us how it is that we're supposed to act and feel. When we have good things going on, we feel good, don't we? And when things are not going well, we feel bad. There's, there, there's nothing outside of that that we often tap into. So we're bound to our circumstances. And how many of you understand that being bound to your circumstances is a horrible thing? How many of you have had such a good life that everything has gone your way? Raise your hand right now because we want to hear all about it. How many of you recognize that life is a series of sometimes extreme highs? 
and sometimes extreme lows and everything in between. And how many of you have gone through disappointments? Maybe even one after another. Maybe you've been in a season where you're like, man, there is a cloud literally hanging over me and I'm getting rained on every day. We've all been through that sort of a thing. And what the Lord is actually saying is, look, there is a joy that comes from me that is beyond circumstance. If only you stop looking at your circumstances and you start looking at me. You see, the thing that Habakkuk literally is tapping into here is he is literally getting his cues from his relationship with the Lord. And how many of you recognize that the Lord promises things like joy? He promises peace that passes understanding. He, en- he promises us things that we cannot muster up on our own, but that He gives to us as we are in relationship with Him. Oh, I'm getting excited this morning. Are you all with me? Disconnect your life from your circumstances and plug yourself into the Lord. Because, and, and you've been around Christians like this, and you've been this Christian before, I guarantee it, where the world was falling apart around you, but you just felt good because you loved Jesus. And Jesus was just imparting all of this goodness on you. And, and, and people would look at your life and they would go, man, how can you even be happy? How many of you had someone ever say that to you? And the truth is, the answer is, because I got the Lord. Because God is doing something in me that cannot be affected by the ups and downs of life. And so we, we have to start looking for the true source of joy. Joy is not found in good times, in good situations. Joy is found in the Lord. True joy is found in Him. The second thing is, if you're in your notes, the second thing is joy is found in the actual presence of the Lord. I'll explain this in a second. Psalm 1611 says this, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And here's something I want you to really get to understand. And you see this in Psalms over and over and over and over again. It is a common theme. But when I am disconnected from the presence of the Lord, the misery of the world comes and fills in the blanks. And if you don't want the things of the world to come in and fill in the blanks, and bring with it the misery it inevitably brings, then you've got to get something to shove that out. You've got to get something to push that away. You've got to get something else to fill all the voids and the nooks and crannies. Now you all are thinking about uh, English muffins. But the truth of the matter is, something's going to fill you. Something's going to fill you up. We have to make a a decision. What's going to be that thing that fills us up? And I'm telling you that as you get into the presence of the Lord, the more of the Lord you will have in your life. And I know that that's not some deep thing to say that. But the truth of the matter is, is that for many of us, the reason why we're walking around sour and depressed and anxious and all of these kinds of things is because we're not spending enough time in the actual presence of the Lord. And let me tell you something. 
sin, the sinful nature, the struggles we have, all of those things flee in the presence of the Lord because He is the ruler and He has dominion and authority over all things. And nothing that He doesn't want in your life is going to exist when you are in His presence because He is going to push that out. And so here's my thing to you. If you need more joy, what you really need is not to chase after more joy. What you really need to do is get at the feet of Jesus. And what you really need to do is soak up Him so that He can fill you up with His presence. And He can bring you these things that you need. The joy is found in the presence of the Lord. The next thing is this, is that joy is found in our salvation. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, it says this, Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And even though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him and are filled, listen, with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I love this phrase that you are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Do you understand what that means? That when you say inexpressible, it means that you can't, like you can experience it. But try to share that information with somebody and they'll look at you like they have no idea because they haven't experienced it. Let me ask you this. Have you ever, have you ever been with a group of people and you tell a story that you think is hilarious and everybody just looks at you like they have no clue what's so funny about what you're saying? And then you're like, well, I guess you had to be there. Right? We've all experienced that sort of a reality. It's no different in this. You're experiencing a joy that comes from the Lord and it's rooted in the fact that you've been saved. But you're experiencing this joy that, experiencing this joy that is so great, it is inexpressible to you, to you. You cannot really share what that means and how that feels and what that looks like everything that you do to try to share that with somebody else it falls sometimes on deaf ears if anything maybe they think well uh, that sounds great but I, I i've never had that i've never experienced that sort of a thing before but do you recognize that that is exactly the kind of joy that the lord is wanting you to experience the kind of joy that's so good, you can't even explain it. The kind of joy that makes no sense to everybody else, only if they were to experience it. This is a gift that comes. And we experience this, and again, it is rooted in the fact that we have been saved. When you walk around knowing that your salvation has come and that even death has nothing over you because even in death it just means life and it just means going and being with the Lord. When, that, when all those things are removed from you because you've been saved, how could you not be excited and joyful? Because what can anybody or any circumstance do to you? Oh, it might make things difficult for a while. But in Christ, we have victory. And that victory brings an inexpressible joy. So our joy is found in salvation. Our joy comes from, listen to this, living a righteous life. Proverbs 10.28 says this, The hope of the righteous brings joy, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. The hope of the righteous brings joy. We talk about righteous, we're talking about living in a morally right way before the Lord. 
This is not tied in to our salvation. We've talked about the difference between uh, these sorts of things in the past. But the idea is, is that when we choose to live according to the righteous uh, deeds of Christ, what we're making a decision to do is to live to a higher moral standard. And let me tell you something. When you set out to live according to the ways of the Lord, what you're doing is you're saying, I'm not going to get steeped in the junk of life. And instead, your focus is bigger. It's better. And you know what? I want to tell you this. If you don't believe me, just believe me this morning and put the pieces together next week. But do you understand that the law was given to us as a blessing so that we might avoid the things that bring destruction into our lives? It was not meant to be a yoke that we were, we were put under. But when God says, hey, you should be doing these things, and He says, hey, avoid that stuff. He's not just giving us a difficult list of things to do. What He's actually asking us to do is say, hey, live to the standard and the junk that brings people depression and the garbage that comes with sin will not have any impact or influence on your life anymore because you will break its power by being a righteous individual. And as we are living righteously, It brings joy. The burdens aren't there. You feel light. You feel good. And that brings happiness. I have yet to literally talk to anybody who is in their right mind who will tell me that when they gave up their addictions and their troubles and they started living according to a clean lifestyle, that they were depressed and had to go back. Now, I've heard some people make those kind of statements, but they're out of their mind. The truth is, freedom that comes in Christ brings joy, and freedom comes through living righteously. Does that make sense? So I want to just ask this question, what is joy? To the Christian. First thing is this, joy is the fruit of our hope. Romans 12.12 says this, it says, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Now the first part of that is very clear. It says be joyful in what? Hope. Here's the thing. For the Christian, joy is the fruit of our hope. And we have hope. We we talked about this within the last couple of weeks because hope was our, 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 our launching point for this series. But we have hope again because of what Christ has done. We have hope because we have something to look forward to. We have hope because we're no longer who we once were, but Christ is making us something different. We have hope because we don't have to live any longer according to the things of this life. We have hope because we're free. But we have hope. And hope is a good thing because it allows us to see beyond our circumstances. It allows us to see something better that is coming. It allows us to not get bogged down in today because there is hope coming and that hope that is coming is going to bring the change that we're looking for. And so we look beyond what we experience right now. And this is one of the things that Christ has come to bring. And it's because of that hope That as a Christian, we can live in joy. But hope is a fruit. Hope hope is a fruit. We are rooted and grounded. uh, I mean, joy is a fruit. We are rooted and grounded in hope. And so that is where we get our nourishment from. 
And so for us, we have to be sure that that's what our life is planted in. That's what we're feeding on. When you feed on other things besides the hope that comes in the Lord, you're going to produce the fruit of those things that you're feeding upon. If you want to produce the right fruit, you've got to be on the right tree. If you want to produce healthy fruit, you've got to be taking the nourishment that is coming from deep down in those roots. Look, you lose the root system, you lose the tree. You lose the tree, you lose the fruit. It's the same thing. And so for us, we need to make sure that we're grounded in that hope because that is what is going to bring forth the fruit of joy. The second thing is this, is joy is our inheritance. Isaiah 35.10 says this, And those that the Lord has rescued will what? Return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee forever. What's the opposite of joy? I think sorrow and sighing pretty much sums it up. But here is the, is the great thing. This is the great message of the prophet Isaiah as he's saying this. He's talking about joy is our inheritance. It's what we receive because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. It is what we inherit. And, and here's the thing. This is specifically talking about that day that we will enter in to the presence of the Lord. And how many of you understand that that day is going to be a glorious day? When the Bible uses the term Zion, it's talking about, uh, in our terminology, heaven, eternity. How many of you understand that an inheritance does not come until somebody dies? You receive an inheritance. You receive that which the deceased individual wanted you to have of their things. You receive an inheritance. But it only happens when they have passed away. And then those things get passed on to you. And hopefully one day you'll pass on something to your children. And we are the children of God. And how many of you recognize that our inheritance comes because Christ died? And that which He desired for us to receive is ours because He has passed it on in His death. Does that make sense to you? And so there is this inheritance that we receive. It is eternal. It is what we have when we go and we are with the Lord. We will experience it in its fullness. But how many of you recognize that what is going to be our eternity sends shockwaves into our now? And that all of the joy and the promises and the hope and the things that we have about entering into Zion and being with the Lord, how many of you understand that in some way we get to experience those things even right now? Joy is an inheritance. It is something that Christ came and He wanted you to have. And He was willing to die to bring that to life. And so here's something I think that we need to recognize. And it's something, as we conclude our thoughts this morning, it's something that I want you to walk out of here with. Is joy belongs to you. That when Christ came, He came and partially what He came to do was to see to it that you would receive the joy of the Lord. And that you would walk in that joy and that joy would become your reality. And as we think about Christ coming, His birth, when we think about Christmas, a part of what we always think about is joy. 
Because even the most messed up of us recognize that in Christ there is joy. And so we're going to close this morning. I'm going to close with a prayer. And here's the thing. If you just need to experience the joy of the Lord, would you go before the Lord this morning as we come into this time of prayer? And would you just ask the Lord to bring you, to let you experience some of His joy in your life? Would you guys stand? Lord, we come to You this morning and we recognize that in You we have joy. We don't have to live in misery, Lord, You can come and You can literally break the, the, the misery off of us. That is Your promise. So Lord, we ask that You would come. That You would fill our hearts with the joy that only comes from the Lord and only comes from knowing You. Lord, we, have, we pray for freedom from all those things that seek to come and fill us with misery. Lord, we thank You. We thank You so much, especially in this season, for the gift of Jesus. The inheritance we can claim because of what He did. So Lord, I just pray even in this week, as we go through the week, I pray, Lord, that You would just fill us with joy. I pray for those that are at home this morning because they are not able to be here. And Lord, there's uh, worry and stress and the weight of, uh, of just life maybe weighing some of them down. I pray, Lord, that You would just fill them with joy, fill their house with joy even today. We just thank You. Because You are good. Lift this up to you. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You guys have a good week. We'll see you next week.